Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you all. Good to see you all. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be back up from Maine. Uh, we were in Maine for Friday night and Saturday. Went up for a youth rally and had a great time in Ellsworth. And um, just excited to see 77 people turn up and come out to hear the word. Excited to see uh, one of the Church of God homegrown actually preach the message. And a good message it was. It was a great time of fellowship and a phenomenal time of worship. And we were just really blessed and excited to bring some of that back with us today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be with you all today. And um, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm a loss for words trying to explain what's going on. And every Sunday I feel like I say that I'm excited and like it loses its potency. But it just never loses its potency. It's true. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited when I look around and see the way that God is moving and the way that God is changing things and the way that God is bringing about His will and His plan and His purpose. And when you stand back and look at it, you can't help but recognize that it's Him and only Him that's doing it. it it's a miracle every single time that we come together, every single time that we lift the name of Jesus up. It's fresh. It's like it's a new time each and every time. Every time with Him is better than the time before. You guys know that song. Every day with you, Lord, is better than the day before. Amen. And every day with Him is better than the day before. I said last week, you know, the day that I got married to my wife was one of the best days of my life. But that wasn't the best day of my life. Today is. Today's the best day of my life. This is the best day that I've ever had. And when I wake up tomorrow, tomorrow will be the best day of my life. Tomorrow will be the best day that I ever had. And come Tuesday morning, Tuesday will be the best day of my life. Every day is better than the day before. <clears throat> and I hope that's the same case with you this morning. That's something that I kind of want to talk about this morning. Um, I want to open with a word of prayer. And then I'd like to get into the bread of life today. Let's break the bread of life together this morning. Father God, we just thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity this morning, God, to be with your people, God, and even more than that, for another opportunity, for a day that was not promised, God, a day that was not deserved. You woke us up this morning, God, clean and sober. You woke us up in a right state of mind. You've given us your grace and mercy, God. What a gift it is that verse should not be taken lightly, that your grace and mercy is new each and every morning, morning by morning. New mercies I see, God. Everything that I have needed, you have provided. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your provision. Great is your blessing. Great is your strength. Great is your power. Great is your might. You are able and you are willing, God. And you already have done it all. We thank you for it this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill this house today. I pray, God, anything in this place, God, that is not of you, we move it aside this morning in the name of Jesus. We come before you this morning expecting, God, a move with an expectation, God, of you doing what you say that you will do. We just expect you to be faithful. We expect you, God, to move and to restore. We expect you, God, to heal and to pull down. We expect you, God, to convict and to call out. We expect you, God, to point the things in our lives that need to change. We expect you, God, to have your way. And we ask you this morning, Father, come and have your way. Have your way in this time. Have your way in this service. Have your way in the message, the words that are spoken. Have your way, God, in every part of this thing, from the opening to the closing. We don't come here for ourselves, God. We come here for you. We don't come here to put on a show. We could care less about any of that stuff. All that we're interested, God, is you and your power as you transform and change lives. And God, we just pray, would you do that this morning? Father, move me aside. Hide me behind the cross. Let your Son be glorified, Father. Use me, every part of me. Everything that I am belongs to you. I commit myself to you again this morning, God. I apply the blood of Jesus over this place over my life, God, and over everything that's here, over every person who is watching. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister and move with power, with might, with authority, with wisdom. And I pray, God, that eyes and ears will be open to hear. God, hearts will be open to receive and understand. And I pray, God, that we would be drawn to you. 
at the end of all of this, that every person here and every person watching and listening would be drawn to you and would experience a relationship with Jesus Christ, the living Son of God. There is nothing that compares with you. Hallelujah. 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 We give you praise. Hallelujah, we give you glory. Jesus, be glorified in this house. Be glorified in this house, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And amen. Man, it's good to be in God's house, isn't it? Amen. So last week we talked about morning to life. That was the message last week. We talked about Terah and Abraham and how Terah, Abraham's father, um, he was initially moving to a place called Canaan. Canaan was the land of God's promise. And God was bringing Terah to this place, but along the way Terah experienced a great loss. Okay, Terah lost his son in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. And because of that, Terah never recovered. Terah never came out of it. Terah actually died there. He passed away. And it was at that time when he passed away that the Lord spoke to Abraham. And he told Abraham to go. Now, in verse 31 of Genesis chapter 11, it says, And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years. And Terah died in Haran. Terah experienced a great loss and he couldn't overcome. <clears throat> so I want to ask you a question this morning. What's the difference in Terah and Abraham? What was it that Abraham was able to do that Terah wasn't? Was Abraham more qualified? Was Abraham more talented? Did Abraham have more resources? Was Abraham wiser than Terah? Did he look better than Terah? Was he more gifted than Terah? Was he more educated than Terah? See, you've got to understand, Abraham came from Terah. Terah was Abraham's father. I believe it should be every parent's desire that our children be greater than we are. As a good parent, it's our job to push our children to greater heights than we are. As a good parent, it's our job to put our children on our shoulders. What does that mean? That means that when I come to something and I have to struggle through it, it shouldn't be as much of a struggle for my child. Why? Because I've already struggled through it. So I struggle through it. I figure out how to do it. I come along. My child's trying to do it. I say, hey, well, let me help you out. I'm already here, so why don't I just help you up to there? And then I help them up to there. And then all I do is support them with it. And then when they come along, I don't have two arms that I can reach that high. But when they come along, they do the same thing. They grab the next thing. And then when their children come along, they're able to pick it up and go even higher. We were talking about this yesterday on the ride back. And I was talking with Michael and, and just kind of going over, you know, the blessing of the generations. And it's funny, the Bible says that there's a curse to the third and fourth generation. But there's a blessing to the third and fourth generation. And to understand what that means, we have to take a look at it. You know? So, if, uh, if my father was the first person who ever welded, the first person to ever strike an arc, imagine how hard that would have been for him to figure out what types of metals you can use, what types of rods you have to have, what does the heat have to be set at, what do you have to use to clean the metal? How fast do you have to move the rod? How slow do you have to move the rod? So he goes through and he learns all of these things. The next person who comes behind him, he can say, hey, check this out. Let me give you some advice. 
These two metals, you can't weld them together. Don't waste your time. These two things you can't use together. You have to use this rod. And if you use this rod, it seems to work better at this heat. So when the person comes in without even having to work, they already have information that they have access to that just makes it easier for them. So then they work at it, and they take it, and they take it to the next level. And the next person comes in, and they've literally got two generations before them. They can come to me and say, hey, how did you do that? And I can say, well, I don't understand all of it, but why don't you come over here and we'll all talk. And then you have three people all doing the same thing. Generations are so important. Abram's father passed away. Abram's father died. Why was Abram so valuable? What was the difference between him and his father, Terah? See, Abram's father, Terah, was tied to an earthly promise. He was tied to something, and when his promise died, he died. His promise was his physical generation. His child was his promise. Abraham. There's a difference in Abraham and Terah. We see it when Abraham finally gets his promise. What is the one thing that Abraham wants more than anything in the world? Let's take a look at this. Let's go in Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and the land that I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation. Say with me, a great nation. A great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. So God calls Abraham and the promise that God gives to Abraham is generations. The promise is what? Generations. God's promise to Abraham is generations. Abraham wants generations. Terah wanted generations too. You see that in Terah's response when he loses one of his generations. It crushes him. The loss of his child destroys him. He was attached so much to his child. He was attached so much to that earthly thing. And it's not only an earthly thing, there's a, there's a balance between the two. There's nothing like the love of a parent for their child. Nothing like it. I don't think there's ever a greater loss than a parent losing their child before they pass away. I can't imagine that loss, and I hope to God that I never have to. I really do. I've lived through it with my family when my brother passed away. I watched what happened with them. I saw it firsthand. I knew how much it was painful for me to lose my brother, but I wasn't a parent to him. I didn't raise him. I didn't feed him. I didn't clothe him. I didn't pour myself into him for the purpose of making him better. So I got to receive a part of the blessing of knowing him, but I only experienced a part of the loss in losing him. Tara, on the other hand, Tara lost it all. He had invested himself into Haran. Verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the nativity in Ur of the Chaldeans. He passed away. Looks like he was the youngest. Haran was the youngest. I don't know, there's just something about the baby. Something about being the baby. Any other babies in here, the youngest? The youngest child? Yeah, there's one over there. You're the youngest child? Yes. Yeah, yeah, nice. There's something about being the baby, right? So he loses his baby. And when he does, he loses everything. So let's take a look at Abram, because I want to find out what's the deal, what's, what's the difference in Abraham with any of these other things here. So God promises Abram generations. Let's go to, first, or to Genesis chapter 15. Start with verse 1. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your reward, your exceedingly great reward. And Abram said to God, What will you give me, seeing that I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and no one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he who shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look towards heaven and tell the stars, if you're able to count them, that's how many children you will have. So shall your seed be. And what does it say? It says, And he believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. And he said in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, where shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, Take a cow three years old, and a she-goat three years old, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took all these and divided them down the middle, and laid each piece against another. So the birds were divided, they were the only things that were not. And when the fowls came, or the, the, the buzzards came on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And lo, a horror, a great terror and darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abraham, Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years with torment and pain. And also that a nation whom they will serve, I will judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And they shall go to your they shall go to your fathers. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Wow. Sorry. They shall go to your fathers in peace. Where are we here? And you shall go to your fathers in peace. And you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, you shall come here from the iniquity of the Ammonites is not yet full. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto your seed I have given this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, and the Kenites and the Kenizzites, and the Kadamites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Raphims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. And God said, I'm going to give you all the ites. You're going to have all the ites. So what's the difference between Abram and Terah? Let's look a little further here. Go to chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between you and multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And shall be, you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your, your name shall be called Abraham. The father of many nations I have made you, and I will make you exceedingly faithful. And I will make nations from you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you and to your seed the land where you're a stranger and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And God said to Abraham, 
you will keep my covenant before. You and your seed after you in all generations. This is my covenant that you will keep before me. You and your seed after you, every child, uh, every child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of the foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every child in your generations. He that is born in the house or brought with money as a stranger who is not your seed. He that is born in the house and he that is brought with the money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised child whose flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah. I will bless her and give her also a son. And I will bless her and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said to God, O oh, that Ishmael might live. And God said to Sarah, and God said, Sarah thy wife will bear you a son indeed, but you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with him and his seed after him. So nations, generations. The blessing was in nations and generations. You see the loss of generations to Terah crippled him. It ended him. But the promise of nations to Abraham pushed him and pressed him. It's interesting how God birthed life out of death. Abraham must have seen the death of Haran. He must have seen the way this impacted his father. Abraham also saw the value that his father held on him as generations. There must have been some sort of a value that was there. And it would appear that Abraham also lost or understood the hurt of loss in a generation. I mean, think of how close that must have been to him. Being, ter uh, being Terah's son and losing his brother, right? He lost his brother. Haran was his brother. So he watched this happen. And then he watched his father lose his son. And because of that loss, his father died. His father lost Haran, traveled from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. And in the place of Haran, he died. He just couldn't get past Haran. That's where his life ended. But it was in that place that God called Abram. And God said, Abram, you've got to get up. And you've got to get out of here to the place that I'm going to call you. Now, it's interesting to me. It never says that Terah worshipped the Lord. It never says that Terah had a relationship with God. It never says that Terah knew God. On the contrary, when you go to the New Testament, there's a passage that says that Terah worshipped <laughs> Beyond the Jordan, other gods. Let's see. Abram was not told this time where God would lead him. Instead, he had to journey under direct guidance from the Lord. Abram's call involved spreading himself from his country, his people, and his household in order to become a stranger and a pilgrim on earth. You can find this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. In Abram, God was establishing an important principle that his people were to separate themselves from all that hinders his purpose in their lives. God promised Abraham three things. He promised him land. He promised him a great nation through his descendants and a blessing that would impact all the generations of the earth. The last element of this promise is taught in the New Testament being fulfilled 
in the missionary proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A blessing to all generations would come from you. What was the blessing? Was the blessing just physical generations? Is it just kids? When the Bible tells us be fruitful and multiply, is it just telling us to go out and have as many kids as we want? <clears throat> I know plenty of children who have parents and are still bastards. I know plenty of children who have fathers, but they don't have fathers. There's a difference in being a daddy and being a father. There's a dis difference in being a, a mommy and a mother. The blessing that God was talking about when he told Abraham, be fruitful and multiply, we talked about this. When God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. When God told Noah, be fruitful and multiply. When God told Abram, be fruitful and multiply. It was not a multiplication of a physical aspect. Oftentimes as humans, that's the first place we go. Praise the Lord, let's be fruitful and multiply. Practice makes people, right? That's what we think. Let's go have kids, make babies, fill and inha inha inhabit the earth. But we see that God doesn't deal that way. If you go back to Adam and Eve, you see that two sons came from them. One was Cain, one was Abel. They were multiplying, but what happened when Cain multiplied? Evil multiplied with him. Cain multiplied what was in him. Cain was fruitful. It just wasn't good fruit. He produced bad fruit. Everywhere that he went, he produced bad fruit. To the point of the fruit that he produced was jealousy, anger, pride, disobedience, rebellion. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. And then you see Abel was one of the, he's one of the blessings. God said be fruitful and multiply. And Abel's reproducing the good things in his father Adam. He offers a good sacrifice to God. He honors God. Why? Because he says God's done so much for me. I need to do this for him. I want to do this for him. How can I not do this for him? And Cain, Cain, instead of saying, well, you know, Abel did such a good job, I should just follow his lead. He doesn't even look at himself. He sees Abel as the problem. He says, if I just kill Abel off, I'll be all set. And so he invites him out into the field and he murders him. So you see the be fruitful and multiply has nothing to do with numbers. It's got nothing to do with numbers. It's not about how many people we can have. It's about how many people can be raised up as a fruitful generation. How many people can be raised up to understand and to know and to fear the Lord? What does God say when He establishes the covenant at the end of the book of Exodus? When Moses brings the law to the people and He presents it before them. He says, tell this to your children and to your children's children beyond you, after you, that they may know and follow and learn and understand and walk in the ways of the Lord. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. This is what God was speaking through Abraham. He wasn't saying that you'll be blessing through all generations by your quote unquote seed. He was talking about the supernatural seed of the Lord of God, of the Word implanted that grows and produces. How do we know that? Go to John 15. When Jesus came to earth, did He walk around the earth as a vine? It's an easy answer. No. He did not. But yet Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus wasn't a physical vine. He was a supernatural vine. He's the source of life that we draw all of our life from. He's the essence of everything that we need. And we find ourselves complete in Him. And in Genesis, when God's talking to Abraham about these generations, He's speaking of spiritual children. People who would come after Abraham and when God speaks a promise to them about a place that's better than this, when God speaks a promise to them about a promised land that they're going to go and inhabit, that when He speaks that, He's speaking it in faith. And when we believe that, we believe it in faith. Believing God's promises the same way that Abraham did. What did Abraham do when God called him? He left. What did he leave? Everything except Lot. But God's good. He's gracious in that, right? Lot comes along. He makes his mistakes. Abraham beefs it a bunch of times and kind of wrecks things. And then finally God separates Lot. And when Lot is finally out of the way, God's able to give the full promise. God gives the full promise to Abraham then. God's good like that. 
He's patient with us. But see, the blessing in that is when Abraham gets it right, his next generation doesn't have to make those same mistakes. He can say, listen, this is what I did wrong. Don't make the same mistakes as me. This is where I messed up. Don't mess up where I messed up. The blessing is in the generations. I have a terrible background. I got a pretty rough history. And I take every opportunity that I can to tell my girls about my background and about my history. Every opportunity that I get, I tell them. They ask me questions. I have no closed doors to them. I'm very transparent to the point where some people may think it's a little bit scary how transparent I am. But I don't, I'm not really interested because I lived in a house where there was no transparency. I grew up in a house where I never got the right answers. I never got the truth. It was always something that was covered up and you just acted like it wasn't there. And what happened in that place is I wound up trying to uncover everything. And when I uncovered it and found that it wasn't what I had been told, I figured everything was wrong. So if I'm honest and open and transparent, maybe I can save them some of those steps. Maybe I can make it easier on them as a generation to get to places that I never got to. Hello? Maybe we, maybe we can make it easier on them to reach places that we never got to. Amen. Maybe we can take them and train them up and without trying to make ourselves seem perfect, without trying to cover over our mistakes, without trying to hide the things that we don't know and we pretend that we do without trying to hide the things that we have done and we want to pretend that we never did. Listen, when God saved me, the blood of Jesus cleansed me from all of my sins and all of my unrighteousness. That's a fact. And I used to think to myself, well, everything is cleansed. It's all just... But well, listen, it is cleansed and it is forgiven and it is forgotten. But I want to explain something to you. Without history, you repeat it. If you don't hold on to the mistakes that you've made and learn from them, you're destined to repeat them. It's dangerous. We don't hold on to the guilt and condemnation. I remember my past with joy. And I also remember my past with humility. Because I have to be willing to take a look at myself and say, Wow, I did this. Why did I do that? I made this mistake. Why did I make this mistake? Why was I willing? I was really dumb. Geez, that was stupid. Why did I do that? But if I just say, well, that was stupid, but it's all forgiven, all the thoughts behind it, all the actions behind it, everything's done, and I just go on, the chances of me redoing that mistake and making that same mistake over and over and over again, listen, it's not a possibility. It's not a matter of if it will happen. It's just a matter of when. When am I going to repeat that mistake until I start saying, wow, I have to make a change to do something different here. We talked briefly about some of the fruit that Abraham produced. We talked about some of the good fruit and some of the bad fruit. Some of the good fruit. When the angels came, Abraham bowed and worshipped them. Lot, who wasn't even a Christian, wasn't even a believer in God. Excuse me. He knew enough about what he had seen in Abraham that when the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he do? He bowed down at their feet, invited them into his house. Hey, come sit with me. Come dine with me. But there wasn't enough washed off there. There wasn't enough of a transformation. Lot still loved the world more than he did God. Abraham loved God more than anything else. God was first. Abraham believed in God's promises. And he was willing to follow, his God, to follow God's promises even if he lost everything. It's amazing to me that the blessing that God offers to Abraham is generations. And the testing that God offers Abraham is generations. God literally goes after the very blessing that he promised him. Takes Abraham a hundred years, one hundred years, to have a seed produced by him and his wife, Sarah. That doesn't include the mistake with Hagar that's, that Abraham's wife foolishly did because she didn't trust the Lord that Abraham foolishly obeyed for the sake of his wife instead of obeying God and produced Ishmael, which caused a whole bunch of problems. I think we covered that a couple of weeks ago. But it took over a hundred years 
for Abraham to see the promise of generations. God finally fulfills this promise when he gives him Isaac. So we talked about the covenant. We talked about the covenant of circumcision. You go into chapter 18. Chapter 18 talks about the three visitors. Genesis chapter 18. That's when the Lord actually visits Abraham. The Son of God, Jesus, comes with two angels and they sit with Abraham and spend time with him. They eat in his house. And then the Lord God blesses him. Jesus actually speaks to him here. And he says to him that, uh, let's see, in verse 9 of chapter 18, he said unto him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, she's in the tent. And he said, I'll certainly return to you, to you according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah your wife will have a son. And Sarah heard it at the tent door which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old in age. They were even stricken in age and increased. It continued to be with Sarah after the manner of women. What does that mean? That means that, listen, she was out of the season of bearing kids. It had come and gone. There was a season, and as far as any woman was concerned, it was just well known that she was beyond that time frame. There was no kids in Sarah's cards. Okay? Isn't it funny how God does that? Has God ever operated based on how the cards are played out? Or on what cards are dealt? He never has. And yet, why is it so surprising to us when God calls us to do things and when God calls us into a lifestyle that's beyond what's dealt? Why is it so scary for us when we know that that's the way that God does things? We read back over, I mean, literally just in the book of Exodus, the amount of miracles that take place in that book is just insane. It's absolutely insane. You know, you have a son who is born at a time when babies are being murdered. The mother sees he's a godly son. She keeps him for months until he's too big. Then she puts him in a basket and floats him down the river. Then the very one who's executing people's daughter finds him and brings him in. Then his sister's there and she says, hey, that's a Hebrew baby. Can I go find somebody to nurse that baby for you? And they say, yeah, absolutely. And they go and get the boy's mom. And his mom literally gets paid to nurse him. That's just the first couple of chapters. The whole Bible is filled with those things. Every pew in this church is filled with with the miracles and testimonies of what God has done. My whole life is an open book of miracles of what God has done. And yet Sarah and all of this, she's seen God call them out. She's seen God's favor and blessing. She's watched God provide. She laughs. It's just funny though because God promises him. He says, listen, now it's the first time he's ever given Abram a time frame. He says, in the time of life, I'll come back to you again next year. I'll be back this time next year. And when I come back, Sarah's going to have a kid. And you're going to call his name Isaac. So let's turn ahead here. We go through chapter 19. Chapter 19 is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We go into chapter 20. That's Abraham and Abimelech. Abraham lies again. Has a big mistake. Then we have the birth of Isaac in chapter 21. And we see Hagar and Ishmael are both cast out. Well, we go all the way to chapter 22. Let's start in chapter 22, verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram or Abraham. He said, Behold, here I am. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham. Abraham's response is, I'm right here. I'm waiting. Give me direction. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you need. I'm here. God says to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And get away from here into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountains, which I will tell you of. Verse 3, And Abram rose early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he clave the wood 
for the burnt offering, and he rose up and went to the place which God had told him. God gave him the promise. He said, generations are going to come from you, man. And then he narrowed the promise down. He said, generations are going to come from you, but they're going to come from you and your wife, Sarah. So that means Hagar's out. It's only going to be from you and your wife. And then he narrows it down and he says, Isaac is going to come from you and Isaac is going to be your seed. And from Isaac, the generations are going to come. Isaac is going to be just like you are with me. We're going to walk together. We're going to talk together. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to increase him the same way. Isaac is going to be your blessing. Abraham laughs at it. He comes back again. He, he narrows it down even more. He says, okay, next year you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Isaac. Sarah laughs at it. It comes to pass, he has the son. Now it's been around 13 years. So Isaac is around 13 years old. And, uh, yes please, that'd be great. Isaac is around 13 years old. And God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, do you remember? I'll just take one, thank you. He says, hey, do you remember that promise that I gave you? You know, he's 13 years old now, you're getting along pretty good. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that promise to a place again where I'm going to show you. Abraham, again, had no idea where he was going. He just had a general direction. He said, you're going to go there. I'm going to show you a mountain. On that mountain, you're going to take that promise that I gave you. You're going to bring him up on that mountain. You're going to build an altar. You're going to prepare the fire. You're going to lay him on that altar, and you're going to sacrifice him. You're going to kill him. It's interesting to me. There's not even a question. Abraham doesn't ask a thing. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get into the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain which I will tell you of. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two young men with him, and he claved the wood for the burnt offering. means he chopped it up. And then he went up to the place which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, You stay here with the donkeys. And I and the lad will go up and worship and come again to you. Abraham's faith in God's promise put him in a place where he was so able and willing to believe in what God had said that he believed that going up... Listen, Abraham had every intention of sacrificing his son. Every intention. The Bible says, if you continue to read, that he was literally raised with a knife, getting ready to stab and kill and burn his son's body. But before he went up to that place, he told the servants, me and the boy, oh, we're going up. But me and the boy are coming back. Abraham said, hey, listen, if God can bring a child from me when I'm a hundred and bring a child from my wife when she's far beyond the years of bearing children, if God can bring me out of a land where my father experienced death and the death killed him, and God can bring me into a promise of life, then God is the one who's able to sustain that life. God's the one who's able to give that life. God's the one who promises the life. God's the one who covers the life and brings it through. Listen, Abraham actually got a covenant with God. God spoke to him and said, hey, go to this land that I'm going to send you to, and when you go there, I'm going to expand you. Abraham says, let's go. He goes to the land. When he gets there, God says, hey, I'm going to expand you. And he expands him. He blesses him. Abraham has more stuff than anybody in that place. The land keeps trying to drive him out because he just overtakes everything everywhere he is. So not only does he have a promise from God, now he sees that God is the God of covenant. Okay? God's the God of covenant. He sees, okay, he's willing to call me, but he who calls me is faithful. He called me to come, I came, I followed him, I'm here. He did everything he said he was going to do. And then when he's there, God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you generations, man. I'm going to expand you to a place you never imagined. 
Your seed is going to be greater than the sand on the seashores. Your seed is going to be greater than the stars in all the sky. And Abraham, very logically, okay, so what does that mean? I don't have any kids. How are you going to do that one? God, how are you going to pull that one off? And God says, you are going to have a seed. And from him, my promise will continue. Just one. Just one seed. God says that he will multiply. Abraham goes through all the periods of doubt, but he never loses his faith. Abraham goes through all the questions, but he never loses his faith. He's not scared to tell God, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? I don't have any children. He says, this guy that's in my house, he's a servant's son. He's really the heir right now. Eleazar. And God says, Eleazar is not the heir. I never said that. I said that you were going to have a son. And your son would be Isaac. So he believed God all the way up until this point, And then God gives him the son. So Abraham's faith at the start was enough to follow. He was willing to follow. Sometimes that's all we need. Is the faith to follow. To listen to God and obey Him. But the thing about faith is that faith, just like anything else, it grows. And as the faith grows, the requirement to invest that faith grows. Once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is no going back. There is no, I don't want to follow anymore. We don't get to wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, I just don't want to be a Christian. I'm all set. I think I'm just going to stop. On the contrary, tomorrow we wake up and our faith should be more than it was today. Our faith should be stronger tomorrow than it is today. Why? Because there's more of a need for it. Why? Because we're walking in more of the promises of God. We're walking more in the blessings of God. And in those blessings and promises, the faith must be tested. Why does it have to be tested? Because if it's not tested, it's not real faith. If I walk around and say, hey, I believe, and then the first thing that comes along hits me, just cuts me down, and then I walk away from the Lord, that's not faith. That's convenience. Some people serve the Lord for convenience. They serve God when it's convenient. They'll talk about Jesus when it benefits them. They'll share about Jesus when it's okay with them. But when it actually comes down to letting go of things in their life and to getting rid of things that God calls us to get rid of, they're not willing to go that far. They say, God, you can come this far, but you're going to stop right there. You will not put your hand on that in my life. Abraham's faith is what God was interested in. Abraham's belief is what God was interested in. Abraham's willingness to give up everything he had for the sake of sharing the faith of God was what was important to him. Why was Abraham's seed going to be blessed? Can you answer me that? Why was Isaac, Abraham's seed, going to be blessed? That's right. Isaac was not a baby. He was a young man. And as a young man, Isaac goes with his father. And his father's faith is strong enough that whatever his father says, Isaac believes. So when Abraham's going up the mountain and he tells his servants, he says, Hey, listen, me and my son, we're going up to sacrifice. And when we get up to sacrifice, we're going to come back down to you. Isaac said, My father doesn't lie. My father believes in the one true God. Abraham had been raising Isaac as a believer of the one true God. Isaac was Abraham's disciple. Abraham was discipling him. Abraham was pouring all of that faith into him. I can see him now. Where's my stool? I can see him now. Isaac sitting next to him. Daddy, tell me again. About how when Grandpa Tara passed away, God told you to come here. Tell me again, Daddy, when, when God told you to leave that place and to come to this place. Tell me again the promise that God gave you. Tell me again when God delivered you and brought you through that situation. Tell me again when God brought you through this situation. And the whole time, Abraham is teaching Isaac how he welded. He's showing him, hey Isaac, listen, this is the type of rod that I used here and this is the type of metal that I used here. And this is the type of heat that I had to have. And the whole time Isaac is just soaking that up. He's just learning from the experience of his father Abraham. And growing in faith. And growing in wisdom. And growing in knowledge. And Abraham's telling him, 
hey, listen, you know, there was a time that I was really stupid. We went to Egypt, and uh, we were hanging out there, and your mom's really pretty, and I thought they were going to kill me, and so I just lied about it. So we see Abraham getting the, giving the best of both worlds to Isaac there. And then you have Isaac. When they go up, Isaac carries the wood like a normal sacrifice. Isaac was familiar with sacrifice. He would have had to have been. And they go up on the mountain and, and he says, Father, where is the, where is the ram? And God, you know, Father Abraham says, God will provide the ram to us. And so he binds the boy and he lays him down. And when he goes to strike him with the knife, everybody always freaks out about that. You know, how dare he do that? Listen, you can say how dare he do that, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. There would be no belief in God if Abraham had chosen to walk away. We wouldn't be where we are today. But it wasn't just the faith of Abraham, it was the faith of Isaac. Isaac allowed himself to be bound. Abraham didn't take his son forcefully. He wasn't a monster. Abraham told his son, listen, this is the way this is going to go. God has told me this, but I can see him. But listen, son, there's a promise. God's told me to do this, but there's a promise. And the promise is that from you are going to come generations. From this are going to come generations. It may look crazy. It may seem foolish. It may not make any sense, but God has promised and we're going to obey God all the way into the end. And if you die, God's strong enough to raise you back to life. Because your seed is the promise. God doesn't change his mind. He didn't change his mind about what was taking place. It was the faith of Abraham. That's why God then becomes the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Because Isaac, in that day, there was a change that took place. The father said, this is the way it's going to go. The son said, okay, I'm willing. Does that sound familiar? It was a foreshadowing of things to come. God the father said, this is the way it's going to go. Jesus Christ the son said, okay, I'm willing. God spared Isaac. But God didn't spare his own son. Abraham was an example of God, the faith that was willing to allow itself to be given to fulfill the promise. That's the blessing of generations. That's the blessing in generations. God's not interested in me reproducing myself. He could care less. I'm not that impressive. I'm really not all that impressive. What's impressive is the miracle of salvation. What's impressive is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's impressive is the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. What's impressive is the freedom that comes through a relationship with the Lord God. What's impressive is the Word of God that comes through Scripture, that's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide even the thoughts and intentions, like bone and marrow, cutting through everything that is and exposing what is. What's impressive is the way the Holy Spirit draws a person into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when they ask Him into their heart, that there's a transformation that takes place there where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, indwells in a person's body and quickens them to life. What's impressive is when we ask Jesus for forgiveness, there's the forgiveness of sins. What's impressive is that God makes a promise. And God not only makes the promise, but He's a covenant God. When He makes the promise... He establishes Himself. He attaches Himself to it. And he, he, listen, He binds Himself to the promise. This is what Abraham did. Abraham had a promise. Abraham bound himself to the God of that promise. And he was not willing to let that promise overtake his binding to the God of the promise. Death happens when we bind to the promise and not to the God. If we lose sight of the God of the promise, and instead we bind ourselves to the promise of the God, when the promise does not appear to be fulfilled, when we don't see the promise going the way that we think that it should go, we die. But when we bind ourselves to the God of the promise, when we bind ourselves to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when we bind ourselves to the covenant God, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It brings us beyond what we can see. It brings us beyond what we can feel. 
It brings us beyond the natural. See, Abraham knew that what God had promised and he was faithful to do. And he was willing to commit himself to that, even to losing the promise for the sake of the one who had made the promise. Aren't you glad this morning we serve a promise-keeping God? Listen, we serve a God who is faithful. The Bible says He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the promise keeper. And God has made a promise this morning. His promise is that if anyone who would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved. His promise is if you confess with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you believe, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you would be saved. His promise is if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you from all unrighteousness. His promise is if you've been a part of the family of God, but you've backslidden, you've walked away, you've fallen away from your faith, you've lost sight of who God was, you took what He gave you and threw it away, and you find yourself outside the promise this morning, His promise is that even when you're faithless, He remains faithful. Even when you don't believe Him, He still believes for you. Even when you're not willing to fight, He's the one who goes before you. He's the one who fights for you. He's the one who has made a way where there is no way. And His promise is this, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I would hear from heaven and I would heal their land. Listen, we pray this all the time. We say, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, but we leave out that spot of turning from the wicked ways. To hold on to the promise and not the God of the promise is a wicked way. To put anything before God is a sin. And the, the wages of sin is death. But we have to understand that there's more to life than physical death. Physical death is such a small thing. Spiritual death. To put anything before God brings spiritual death. If you feel spiritually dead this morning, then I want to tell you, Today is the day for you. Take your eyes off of the promise and fix your eyes on the promise maker. Take your eyes off what you feel. And listen, don't ever let go of the promise. If God has promised you, don't ever stop believing. I feel like I'm singing a journey song this morning. Don't ever stop believing. Don't ever stop believing. Hold on to the promise that God has given you. Hold on to what God has spoken to you. Follow in Abraham's footsteps. God said Abraham was the father of nations. We are those nations. We're the nations that came from Abraham. Not just physical flesh and blood, but spiritual flesh and blood. Our spirits are alive because of the faith of Abraham. God said He credited it to Abraham as righteousness. What did He credit to him? His faith and belief that God was able to fulfill that promise. We're going to continue to look at this next week as we press into the promises of God and as we look at going from life to death we're continuing to talk about being alive in the spirit how many people are alive this morning in the body but dead in the spirit a crushed spirit a dead spirit will produce a death Tara's spirit was crushed and it took his life with it. If your spirit is crushed this morning, come to the one who gives life. Come to the one who heals. To the one who restores. And come to the one who's able to give you a promise and bring life out of death. Hallelujah. So much more that I want to say this morning. So much more that's on my heart. Let's pray. If you're watching this morning and you find yourself in a situation, whether you've never been with God or whether you find yourself apart from God, neither one of those remain the same today. Today God is calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you by name. He's calling you right where you are. Whatever it is that you find yourself in, He knows. He knows everything about it. It's no mistake that you're here with us this morning. It's no mistake that you've tuned in. It's no mistake the message is being preached. If you're sitting there thinking, this is for me, listen, it's for you. 
it's for you. I'll answer that question for you. The next question is the one that you have to answer. What are you going to do about it? God's calling you. But what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with the call that God is placing on your life right now? The Holy Spirit is drawing to you. The Bible says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and you'll find rest for your souls. Come to me. All you who are broken, all the brokenhearted, all the empty, all the lost, all the confused. The Bible says that Jesus declared, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. If you find yourself this morning trying to find your way, if you find yourself this morning looking for truth, and if you find yourself this morning feeling like you just don't have life, Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. And he says anyone who would come to him would not be ashamed. Anyone who comes to him would never be ashamed. Wherever you are this morning, just ask him to come into your life. It's not a, there's no magic here. There's no trick. It's no parlor trick. This is a real thing. Wherever you are, in your own words, from your own situation, you tell God where you are. You tell God what's going on. And you ask Him to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you, and to save your soul. Father, this morning, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your word is true. You said anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, anyone who believes in their heart that God raised Him from the dead would be saved, would be saved. And your word says that every angel in heaven rejoices over just one sinner, God, who repents. God, I rejoice with the repentant sinner this morning. I rejoice, God, and celebrate the gift of salvation that's given freely by you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way today. If that's you this morning and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to plug you in somewhere where you can be encouraged, you can be supported. We'd love to uh, get a Bible into your hands or, or whatever it is that you need. We just want to be in a relationship with you. Um, it's so easy to do this and then to walk away like nothing has changed. And we don't ever want that to be the case. We want you to know how much has really changed today by you asking Jesus into your heart and how much has really changed today by you being willing to follow Him. And this morning, in the second half, is if you've experienced Jesus but you're so far away from Him and you're believing this morning that you've just gone too far, listen, that's a lie from the enemy. That's a lie from the pit of hell. No one ever goes too far. And you don't have to go far anymore. Just ask Him this morning. 1 John 1, 9. Confess with your mouth. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ask Him this morning. God, in the name of Jesus, forgive me for falling away from You. In the name of Jesus, forgive me for not listening to You, for not obeying Your Word. Forgive me for turning my back on You and doing what I want to do, God, and I'm choosing today to turn back to you. And in the same way the Bible tells us about the prodigal son, Jesus turns back to you this morning. His face shines on you this morning. He restores the joy. And if you're that person who has done that, you've recommitted this morning, and you, again, feel like you're doing it on your own, don't do it alone. Reach out. Plug in. Get someone to walk with you, someone to pray with you, someone to speak into your life, someone to hold you accountable when you go to slip away in the things that you've done before, someone to literally go side by side with you and to walk with you in your walk, to strengthen you, to challenge you, to encourage you and to push you to be all that you could ever be. If that's you this morning, then we praise God for you, we thank God for you, we pray God bless you and keep you. And if it so be that it's us, then let us know. And if not, pray and let the Lord lead you to the person that He wants to put in your life. And I pray that you would just follow and be obedient to that. Be obedient to the Lord and what He's calling you to do. We want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. We look forward to being with you again next Sunday as we continue in talking, living in the Spirit. God bless you and have a great day.